Noon's presentation by uh, pre presented by the Wisconsin League of Women Voters and the American Society of Civil Engineers Wisconsin section. This is a final in a series of presentations on investing in Wisconsin's infrastructure. This is the last of the category presentations. We saved the best for last. And we will hear from the two ASCE professional lawyers who authored the 2020 Wisconsin Infrastructure Report Card. After their presentations, we will have uh, um, remarks by uh, panel members. We have we put together an excellent um, representative panel to uh, talk about some of the details. Just to remind you, this program is being recorded and will be available on the LWVWI YouTube channel for those, especially local officials who weren't able to attend today. I'm Dorothy Skye, the League's moderator for today's presentation. Next slide, please. This slide just gives you a brief overview of today's program, the presentations, the panel discussion, and then the Q&A. Next slide, please. Why is the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin working with the American Society of Civil Engineer Wisconsin section on this project, this infrastructure project? Well, in September of 2020, the ASCEWI published the 2020 Wisconsin Infrastructure Report Card. And they invited the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin To uh, join them, sorry folks, one little thing I didn't count on. Um, they invited the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin to join them to help educate the public about the report card. And after reading that report card, we enthusiastically accepted that invitation. The report card evaluates 13 categories of infrastructure, aviation, bridges, dams, drinking water, energy, hazardous waste, inland waterways, ports, roads, solid waste, stormwater, transit, and wastewater. These are aspects of infrastructure we all rely on every day. Energy received a grade of B. That's adequate for now. Hazardous and solid waste, today's topics, got a B minus. The rest, or the rest of the categories received Cs, which means mediocre requires attention or Ds, poor and at risk. The report card is a heads up that we can't take these systems for granted. They are aging. Infrastructure crosses local and state jurisdictions and requires public financing to design, build and maintain. These systems are um, designed to serve the public and to protect us and to protect our environment. And because we, the people ultimately pay for Wisconsin's infrastructure, we will be asked to pay to fix it and address the issues ongoing with, with infrastructure, even as we have to address such big things as the COVID pandemic and climate change. So we better be informed for our for our own sake and so that we can inform and push local officials. The League of Women Voters of Wisconsin supports increased investment in infrastructure. We need to fund ongoing operations and maintenance, improvements and innovation. As we learned during our overview meetings in this series, we can raise infrastructure grades and pass on valuable assets to our children and grandchildren. Infrastructure is an asset on the, on the, on the ledger, it's, it's, it's on the asset side. We got the next slide there, okay. Um, oh, go back. Back, back, one, back one, please, Daniel. We're gonna start with a little, um, grounding orientation about 
the American Society of Civil Engineers, Wisconsin section. And that's going to be given to us by Carl Sutter. Carl is a senior vice president of the Environmental and Infrastructure Division of McMahon Associates in Nina, Wisconsin. He's a professional engineer and certified construction specifier with a BS degree in civil and, civil and environmental enge engineering from the University of Wisconsin. He has over 40 years of experience in engineering, most of it in the public realm of environmental and infrastructure engineering. So Carl, ground us, get us hey, going. Thank, thank you very much, Dorothy. The American Society of Civil Engineers is the oldest professional engineering organization in the United States. It is a not-for-profit society and was founded in 1852 in New York City. It is worldwide with over 150,000 members in 177 countries. It also consists of nine institutes which specialize in specific areas of civil engineering. These institutes are architectural engineering, coasts, oceans, ports, and rivers, construction, engineering mechanics, environmental and water resources, geotechnical, structural, transportation and development, and utility engineering and surveying. The Wisconsin section of ASC was established in 1923. It comprises most of the state with the exception of the area near Superior and consists of four branches and 1,886 members. ASC works to raise awareness of the need to maintain and modernize the nation's infrastructure using sustainable and resilient practices, advocates for increasing and optimizing investment in infrastructure, and improve engineering knowledge and competency. Civil engineers are global leaders building a better quality of life. Our society mission is to provide essential value to our members and partners, advance civil engineering, and serve the public good. Our code of ethics lists that engineers, first and foremost, protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. This presentation is part of our advocacy and education effort, and I'd like to thank the League for helping us put this on. At this point, I'd like to introduce Louise Piedring. She's the immediate past president of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin, who will give a brief introduction to the League of Women Voters. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. With 2,800 members in local leagues seen on this map, the league work is also recognized by partners and donors. Over 5,000 members and supporters across Wisconsin contribute to our mission to empower voters through education and advocacy and to defend democracy. While we are a political organization, we are nonpartisan. We neither support nor oppose political parties or candidates, though we do engage in politics. Our political action is based on our issue positions established after member study of diverse sources, discussion of those, and consensus. As an organization of 101 years, it is our long held and more recent positions that root our advocacy. Advocacy in the interest of good government of, by, and for the people, all people. Our positions relate to infrastructure directly or indirectly. That means that league members have a natural interest in investing in infrastructure because how we build and manage our infrastructure determines the health of people and communities, the health of our environment, and the health of our economy. Back to you now, Dorothy. Thank you. Next slide. The first part of our program, the first presentation is on hazardous waste. And as the slide shows, it got a grade of B minus, which means good, that's somewhere between good, which is adequate for now, and mediocre, which is requiring attention. And I'll just remind you again that while you're listening during the presentation, during this talk and the subsequent ones, please enter your questions in the chat. And if you want to direct it to a, a specific speaker, state that as well. Laura Gintz from the 
State League will be monitoring the chat and we will address your questions after we finish hearing from the panelists. Next slide, please. Our premier presenter for the hazardous waste section is the lead author of that section of the report card. Dr. Gretchen Bonoff is an associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering at UW Platteville. Her studies focus on the intersection of environmental engineering, geotechnical engineering, groundwater and groundwater engineering. That sounds like a pretty busy intersection, Gretchen. <laughs> Her research has a common theme of sustainable and novel solutions to waste containment and the fate and transport of contaminants in our geo environment. She is a registered professional engineer in the state of Wisconsin. Dr. Bonops is also a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Water Resources Association, and the American Society for Engineering Education. So with that, Gretchen, please take it away. All right, thank you very much. And my slide deck should be coming up hopefully shortly. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, I am going to be talking about the hazardous waste section of the 2020 uh, ASC Wisconsin Infrastructure Report Card. Uh, next slide, please. And an outline of what I'm going to go over today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the team that put together the hazardous waste section of the report card uh, and the process that we went through uh, putting together this section. Uh, then I'll go into the details, talking about the condition and capacity of hazardous waste in Wisconsin and the operation and maintenance funding and future need regarding hazardous waste in Wisconsin. Finally, I'll talk about public safety and innovation and some ways that we can raise, raise the grade. Next slide, please. All right, so first I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors um, so I was the chair or the lead of the hazardous waste section in the report card, uh, but I had three co-authors, Jerry Demers, um, Ken Micah, and Alyssa Selwood. And uh, putting together this group, it was really important to form a group that was knowledgeable about, about this topic, but also we thought it was important to have members from a variety of backgrounds. So. Um, we had background in consulting, uh, in regulatory agencies, and myself in academia. Um, so in addition to uh, the, the report card authors, we thought it was important to make sure we were including the regulatory agencies in the process of drafting this report card um, to make sure that we are collecting data that was accurate and up-to-date. So they were part of the process. They um, directed us towards the pertinent information uh, and also reviewed the chapter after it was completed. Um, so stepping back a little bit about the process, uh, my co-authors and I drafted the chapter on hazardous waste, and then it went through several reviews. First, it went through regulatory agency review, and then Wisconsin section of ASCE and um, ASCE National reviewed it before it was finalized and published. Next slide, please. Okay, so you may have seen this before, but and if you've gone to some of the other presentations, um, our goal was to grade the infrastructure, specifically this chapter, we are looking at grading hazardous waste. And so we are grading anywhere between A and F, where A was exceptional and F was failing or critical. And as you saw already, um, hazardous waste got a grade of B minus. So that was somewhere in between good and me mediocre. And we'll talk about that more in, in a little bit. Next slide, please. So in order to come up with the grade and uh, draft the chapter on hazardous waste in Wisconsin, uh, we looked at eight different criteria. So the criteria included looking at capacity and condition of hazardous waste in Wisconsin, the funding and future need, operation and maintenance, public safety, and then resilience and innovation. Next slide, please. Okay, so getting into the details um, on the chapter or and hazardous waste in Wisconsin, uh, 
To start out, I'd like to say that Wisconsin has been a leader in hazardous waste cleanup and brownfields and emerging contaminant issues uh, such as PFAS. And so that's why this picture is relevant because we're looking at uh, the Pike River in Marinette County, Wisconsin, and there's been PFAS contamination in Marinette and Peshtigo area um, that's undergoing study at this time. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Wisconsin has been a leader. Um, and in order to understand uh, so the state of, of hazardous waste in Wisconsin, is under, we need to understand kind of the process. So in Wisconsin, the Remediation and Redevelopment Program or the r, &R program implements the state hazardous substance cleanup programs and the federal programs in cooperation with the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency. Next slide. Okay, so I have a few slides now on condition and capacity of hazardous waste. Uh, this first one is on Superfund sites. And so to talk about Superfund, we need to step back to 1980 when US Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA. Um, so this program is commonly referred to as Superfund, and it provided federal authority to respond to potential impacts to human health and the environment as a result of releases of hazardous substances. So if we look at Superfund sites in Wisconsin, um, we currently, or at the time of writing this report card, um, had 36 sites on the national priorities list or Superfund sites. And that's only 3.1% of the total uh, Superfund sites across the nation. When we look at the state of these sites, uh, 34 of them um, remedial action, action has taken place. Uh, one is in the remedial investigation feasibility study phase, and one was in the remedial design remedial action phase at the time of writing the report card. Um, 28 of those that are in the remedial action phase are working towards site-wide ready for anticipated use and delisting, which is the end goal. Next slide, please. All right, so the next topic is brownfields. And so if you've heard of brownfields before or haven't heard of brownfields before, brownfields are abandoned or underused properties that have perceived or actual contamination which hinders potential development. So one of the keys for brownfields is that there may not actually be contamination at these sites, but it may be the perception of contamination based on historical activity at these sites. Um, once again, the DNR's r, &R the Re Remediation and Redevelopment Program, um, is in charge of the brownfield sites, and they provide a variety of financial and liability clarification resources for parties that are involved with brownfield redevelopment. Um, in addition, the DNR and the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation has staff and resources to educate users and facilitate access to these funds. If we look at the state of Wisconsin, uh, between 2003 and 2018, there have been 39 recipients of uh, federal brownfields grants. In addition to those federal grants, there is also funds that are available through the state for environmental site assessment and for site cleanup. Um, in addition, the state has a, a brownfield studies group. And so this is an external advisory board that was created back in 1998. And they provide recommendations on the current and future initiatives in the state related to contaminated land rede uh, remediation and redevelopment. Um, and shown on the screen here is the report that came out in 2015 um, titled Investing in Wisconsin, Reducing Risk and Maximizing Return. And this provided recommendations on liability and financing tools for local governments, emerging technologies, et cetera. So when it comes to brownfields, Wisconsin has a very well-designed and integrated brownfields program and it is used as a model by other states. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've got brownfields and super fun sites, but overall there's just state hazardous waste sites. And um, every year the state receives hundreds of reports of contamination that's required by law, is required by law. And the state 
Um, the rule series that governs the process of site investigation and cleanup is the NR 700 series. Um, fortunately, the number of new reports per year has gone down substantially since the 1990s, where there was over 1,000 reports per year. More recently, it's been on the order of two to 300 uh, reports per year. In addition to having fewer sites being reported, sites are being cleaned up. Um, and being approved by the DNR. So between 1994 and 2018, the DNR approved cleanups at more than 24,000 sites within the state. Um, and so shown on the screen here are some of the tools that are available to us. The Wisconsin Remediation and Redevelopment Database um, is a system that provides uh, information on contaminated land within the state. And there's two different ways that you can view this information. On the right-hand side is the Bureau for Mediation and Redevelopment Tracking System on the web, or BOTW. Um, or you can look at the r and Sites Map, which is a GIS application um, on the left-hand side. And you can use either of these systems um, to look up cleanups that are underway, cleanups that have been completed, uh, financial assistance, liability incentives, et cetera, for various sites around the state. Next slide, please. So last under condition and capacity is um, the leaking underground storage tanks program. And uh, DATCAP or the Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection is responsible for regulation and enforcement of underground storage tanks. Um, they've got a total of about 184,000 uh, storage tanks in the state of which almost 12,000 of them are federally regulated as part of the leaking underground storage tank program. Um, the DNR oversees the cleanup that are a result of petroleum products being released into the soil and the groundwater. Next slide, please. All right, so moving on to operation and maintenance, funding and future need. Um, so uh, some of the data that's presented in the report card comes from a January 2019 report from the Wisconsin Legislative, Legislative Fiscal Bureau. They summarized the status of funding programs for um, cleanups, cleanup of contaminated sites in Wisconsin. Um, the DNR is the primary administrator of the federal and state cleanup programs. Um, and in 2018-2019, they had 114 and a half staff and approximately 100 point or $11.9 million to administer this work. So um, although cleanup costs are generally paid for by responsible parties, uh, Wisconsin also has a variety of local, state, and federal funding programs to help incentivize redevelopment of contaminated properties, including brownfields. Um, so if we look back at that 2015 brownfield study report, uh, there's some data on monies from that. So approximately $162 million was spent on the redevelopment from brownfields. 75% of that was coming from state brownfields grants and funds. 18% was coming from federal programs and 7% from local tax incentives. And finally, if we look at site, sites that have the state lead, um, so those are sites that pose a risk to the environment and human health, but don't have viable responsible parties. Um, landfill tipping fees are sufficient for funding the two to $4 million per year that's allocated to investing, investigating and cleaning up these sites. Next slide, please. Okay, so public safety and innovation. So there are some emerging issues that the DNR is addressing, which include previously unclassified or newly determined contaminants or pathways that can put, pose risk to human health and the environment. So one of those pathways is vapor intrusion and um, contaminants, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this today, is PFAS. Um, so these emerging issues require research, public outreach, and new policy to mitigate to mitigate risks to public health. So as I mentioned, the two recent focus areas are the vapor intrusion risk pathway and PFAS substances. 
Um, Wisconsin has been a leader among the states in developing guidance and training to address vapor intrusion. So what is vapor intrusion? It is the migration of chemicals from an underground source into structures such as homes, businesses, or schools. And as I said, Wisconsin has been a leader among the states in developing guidance and training uh, to ensure that vapor intrusion is addressed. Um, there is a DNR uh, leadership position on vapor intrusion, and also the website has uh, resources to guide and guidance materials for um, the public and for professionals. Uh, so in addition to the new threats that are, are posed by vapor intrusion, uh, the DNR has been active looking at PFAS. There is a PFAS technical advisory work group. Um, in addition, the Wisconsin PFAS Action Council uh, developed um, the Wisconsin PFAS Action Plan. And so you can see that here it was, um, that came out in December of 2020. And this PFAS Action Plan will serve as a roadmap for how state agencies will address these emerging chemicals. So moving on to innovation, um, the DNR allows for innovative remediation approaches that are more sustainable. And so the DNR has published the Wisconsin Initiative for Sustainable Remediation and Redevelopment recently, which has a few uh, specific sites that serve as examples for more um, sustainable remediation alternatives. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we've mentioned, uh, after reviewing all of the information, hazardous waste uh, received a grade of B minus. So somewhere in between the, the good and, and the C grade. And so there's, oh, there's room for improvement, right? We don't wanna be at a B minus. So what can we do to raise the grade? That's the next slide, please. So establishing and maintaining funding and prioritizing sites with the highest risk to health and safety of the public are the primary concerns regarding hazardous waste sites in Wisconsin. So ASDE supports these recommendations to raise the grade. The first is to establish a process to identify sites with the highest risk. And if we can do that, it will help prioritize remedial action and to guide the level of response at those sites. In addition, increased funding for the site, sites that have the state lead, and also to create a trust fund to uh, fund loans for brownfield projects. Um, finally, there are recommendations from the 2015 Brownfield Studies Group, and so implementing those recommendations um, is another way that we can raise the grade regarding hazardous waste. Next slide, please. Okay, so that is um, the information I have regarding hazardous waste in Wisconsin. If you're interested in looking at the infrastructure report card or details on different sections, here's some of the contact information and also a place for further questions. Uh, but I look forward to the panel discussion and questions at the end also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gretchen, you've given us some key insight into what all was involved with hazardous waste. So now we will go on to solid waste. And that also has a grade of B minus, somewhere between uh, good and me mediocre. And our report card author and expert speaker on this, is Michael Penn. Next slide, please. Mike Penn is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Wisconsin Platteville, where he's been teaching and doing research for nigh on to 24 years. Prior to joining the UWP faculty, he worked for other universities and industries. He received his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Michigan and his PhD from Michigan Tech. He's the lead author of the textbook titled Intr Introduction to Infrastructure and is a founding member of the Center for Infrastructure Transformation and Education. 
He's been involved in all the ASCE Wisconsin section infrastructure report card reports beginning clear back in 2008. Let's welcome Michael Penn. Hi, uh, it's my pleasure to be here again. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I think, yep, the slides are coming up there. So um, I'm just gonna change the first word, go from hazardous waste to solid waste. And uh, thanks to Gretchen uh, for giving an uh, overview of the process. This is a funny thing I like to share that Gretchen and my offices are two doors apart and our houses are two doors apart. So fortunately we get along very well. So I'm gonna follow the same outline. So next slide, please. So the team that put this together, again, we try to get a diverse team. Uh, myself, Jerry Demers, who uh, I think maybe have, has joined us here for the Q&A. Uh, was also helped out with uh, Has Waste. And Larry Beekle, who is the new Wisconsin section of ASCE president. Next, please. So hazardous waste can be kind of scary. Uh, municipal solid waste is pretty messy. <laughs> uh, so what we focused on the report is, is a subset of solid waste, which we call municipal solid waste. So you can think of that, which is be uh, that which would be coming from residences, businesses, institutions, and it's estimated that. About five pounds per person per day are generated in Wisconsin, and that's pretty even with EPS estimates of the national average. Now, it doesn't mean if you're saying, I do not put out five pounds of garbage a day. Well, you probably don't. Um, I hope you don't. Uh, but what that means is if you take all of the waste, for example, in a community, from the households, from the businesses and institutions that support the members that live in that community and then take the whole mass and then divide it by how many people are in the community, usually comes out to be about five pounds, averaged over the whole state. Okay, next. In terms of uh, where that waste goes uh, in Wisconsin, uh, here are the estimates. Again, this is not uh, very different from national average across all states. Uh, with about two thirds being landfilled, about a third being recycled and composted, and a small fraction being incinerated for energy recovery. Next, please. Uh, with the majority going to landfills, uh, I thought we'd just give some uh, basic inf information about landfills for those that don't know. Uh, the engine or Landfills today are highly engineered and highly regulated with liners uh, to protect the groundwater. So the picture you see on the top there is a construction of a new landfill cell and you can see that liner is being placed. The waste would be placed on top of uh, that liner. And again, the liners protect the groundwater. On top of the liner, we have uh, collection systems to withdraw what we call leachate or I like to call garbage juice. Um, but if we get that water out of there and it's not accumulating on top of the liner, then it's even less likely to be able to get into the groundwater. Uh, gas is also generated as a result of the decomposition of the waste. So um, these landfills are designed with gas extraction and treatment systems, often with energy recovery. You can see a gas well at the bottom because uh, methane makes up a substantial portion of that gas, and uh, that is clearly an energy source. It's basically natural gas, renewable natural gas. And groundwater monitoring is also required at the landfills to determine uh, whether or not contamination actually does occur. Next, please. So as a result, we're seeing fewer but larger landfills in the state. And again, we're seeing this across uh, the country. And we do have sufficient capacity. Surprisingly, no new landfills in the state since 1996. Uh, what that means is no 
new landfills, like to just go out somewhere and start digging up to put in a new landfill. But we do have more capacity and that capacity has been achieved through expansions of existing landfills. Oh, I happened to catch the chat. I'm not monitoring them because we said we have the questions at the end, but there was one that I happened to see pop up about, are we taking out of state solid waste? We are, but it has dramatically decreased over the last 10 years. So um, I can't remember the percentage, but it, it is, I'm, it is certainly more than 90% of that, which is landfill comes within the state, right? And the amount of in-state waste being generated has remained quite steady over the last 10 or so years, as you can see, at about 4 million tons per year. Thank you. Next. Now, with respect to recyclables, um, I'll take a second to just explain this graph because as soon as you put a graph, everybody looks at it. So on the left, what we have is thousands of tons. On the bottom, what we have are the years. And um, so this is basically a 10 year period. Don't have the most recent data on there, sorry. And each of these lines is a different category of recyclables that you may be familiar with from curbside recycling. So the top one is not the total, right? The top one is just the highest category and that being paper. But what you can see is that paper has been declining. This is the amount that's been collected for recycling. And paper in general is declining in the waste stream. Uh, we see a uh, recent increase in cardboard uh, recycling and the demand for that fiber, which is good. But in general, you can see most of these lines relatively stable in terms of the amounts of materials that we're collecting for recycling over the last 10 or so years. Next, please. Okay, moving on uh, quickly to operations, maintenance, funding, future need. Uh, the solid waste facilities are, uh, are regulated. And as a result of that, we do have uh, procedures in place for reporting and site inspections to help ensure that they are being properly operated and maintained. One thing that is unique to solid waste is that it is very much a mix of public and private ownership and operation. As you think of most roads, they're public roads. It may be state or county or city, but right with, with solid waste, it's very much a mix. Uh, one of our panelists is from Marathon County, and Marathon County has their own landfill. Dane County has their own landfill. But we also have lots of uh, privately owned landfills. So with that mix, that makes funding, the mix of funding more complicated. Um, but in the end, you know, a, a lot of this ends up being market driven. Uh, another unique thing is that it is, depending on where you are, solid waste management may be very local um, at a community level or a county level or at a regional level. And the next one seems really obvious, but I'm setting myself up for the next slide is that revenues and expenses have to balance. You can't keep doing this if you're losing money, if you're public or private. So next slide, please. Uh, especially with regard to recycling, um, you may or may not be aware of this, but um, a very a substantial fraction of recycled materials actually goes to overseas markets. Some estimates of as much as maybe a third. And again, I'll explain the graph here. On the bottom, we have years. So this is 1985 all the way up to 2019. On the left here, you see the price and you see it's highly fluctuating. This price is dollars per ton. And this price reflects the composite value of mixed curbside recycling. So you imagine all the stuff in the bin, if you put it out, right? It's the, what fraction of it is aluminum, what fraction is plastic, which fraction is this cardboard, and the price that each one of those individual commodities has on the market and a weighted average of that. So what's that bucket, what's a ton of that bucket worth after you separate it out and, and send it out, right? 
And again, this is wildly volatile. And um, because, uh, well, for lots of reasons, but because a, a big driver for that is that it's not just a local market, but these are global markets. The, the big decrease we've seen here recently, one of the main drivers for that has been, and you may have heard of this, but has been a change in China's policy for accepting recyclables. And they were a very large importer of uh, recycled waste products prior to that change of policy. Okay, next slide. So, uh, so the end result there, uh, you know, everybody I know wants to recycle, but most people I know don't understand how complicated it really is. So we have to, you have to separate these things out from solid waste first place, often done at the curb or dumpsters, right? So we have to collect it, we have to process it, we have to separate it, and we have to transport it to markets, and then it has to be further processed. And these costs often exceed the revenues from material sales. And going back to that previous graph, how volatile those prices are, when things are great and you're way up at the top of that list, you can make money doing this. But when things are not great, you lose money doing this. So it's, it's really hard when things are shifting that fast and can't be predicted. It's almost like trying to guess the stock market if any of you try that. Okay, another emerging issue is electronic or what we call e-waste. So uh, think of cell phones and laptops and TVs and things like that. These are banned from landfills in Wisconsin. But again, the collection and the recycling of uh, these components, especially because they're so complex, there's so many different materials in there, really is a logistic and economic challenge. Next slide, please. Okay, moving on to public safety and innovation quickly. I threw in this not your grandparents landfill quote at the top. Um, many of our old unregulated, unlined, I would say not really managed landfills ended up being super fun sites that Gretchen just talked about, right? But these new highly engineered regulated and supervised sites uh, are a significant improvement and a reduction in public safety risk. With respect to innovation, um, from the landfill standpoint, uh, the, the way landfills are operated, basically, you may have a very large landfill site, but they're what we call active cells. And then the lifespan of that cell may only be about 10 years. And then it can be temporarily covered. And then you do the next cell and fill that. And then the next cell. And unlike a lot of other types of infrastructure, which may have design life 50 or 100 years, think of a bridge. You put in a bridge, you're stuck with a bridge for 100 years. Um, the fact that these, these cells have shorter lifetimes means that as we progress on with new cells, that facilitates the ability to adapt um, new design approaches and new technologies. So that's good. Also with uh, respect to recycling, you see the picture in the lower right. Uh, there has been, and there will continue to be innovation for separating out recyclables. The picture shown is a robotic sorting of plastics to separate plastics out on a, a conveyor belt of, of curbside recyclables. Okay, next slide, please. So again, um, much like hazardous waste, we um, came up with the evaluation of the grade as being a B minus, which relative speaking across all the different sectors of infrastructure is quite good. Uh, next slide. Recommendations to raise the grade. Uh, for many reasons, it's really challenging to get good data on solid waste. Um, I don't want to pick on transportation, but it's pretty easy to, to put a counter down on a road and know how many cars go by. It is not so easy to figure out what's in the waste and how much is being generated, uh, especially even amplified by the fact that it's local, regional, public, private, right? But any efforts to get more data about 
what's being generated and what's happening to it is going to help guide decisions. And also openly distributing that data is going to help enhance uh, public understanding. So the second one there is to conduct a statewide uh, waste characterization study. These have been done in the past. And uh, this is a major undertaking, but basically what, what is done is you try to subsample the waste that's being generated in the state. So you pull aside trash trucks, basically, bring them in, dump them out on the floor, and then have uh, trained workers sort through that waste and put it into all the different categories and then weigh it to figure out the composition within that truck. And then to do that for enough trucks that it's statistically significant to give you a good guess of what the actual is in at different locations across the state. So it's a big undertaking, but that lets us know what's in the waste. And the composition of waste is and always has been changing. So again, what's in the waste that helps us decide what we need to do with it. Uh, third, with respect to recycling grants, I mentioned the challenges of recycling. Um, economically, the state does have uh, grant appropriations, for example, that could go to cities or counties. And um, unfortunately, that the amount, the sum of those appropriations has not increased over the last 10 years. It's basically flatlined. And um, it's at levels that are much less than the peak of those appropriations back in the mid 90s. Next slide, please, for a few more recommendations. Very importantly, uh, increased waste reduction efforts by everyone. Because if you don't generate the waste, you don't have to manage it. Quite simple. And we've made great strides, but there's a lot more that we can do. Next, continue your efforts to increase the collection efficiency of recyclable materials. So this gets at the fact that uh, of all the recyclables that we collect, we only collect a certain fraction because they aren't properly sorted at the source. So they end up in the wrong dumpsters. They end up going in vast majority of cases to the landfill. So if we can get more of that material properly sorted initially, especially things of high value, like plastics number one and two and aluminum, right? We're keeping on landfill and then we're increasing that you know, net price of the recyclables that we're collecting, because these are very high value items. Lastly, sustainable solid waste management requires an evaluation of economic, environmental, and social impacts. So we're hopefully striving always that it's not just about the dollar, but it is in fact a very challenging and delicate balance of the environment, the economy, and social impacts. Okay, next slide. So that summarizes, or that's my quick summary of, uh, of the chapter there. Carol had asked me to spend just a few minutes to talk about a project that I've been involved with, which we call City Center for Infrastructure Transformation and Education. Next, please. And basically um, what this is, is a collaboration of faculty from universities across the country. And in fact, we even have some international um, collaborators. This is only a partial listing I show here. And um, we're actively seeking to grow this community of like-minded faculty. And our mission primarily is to try to raise awareness about infrastructure, right? We're all civil, most of us are civil environmental engineering faculty, but to change the way we teach civil and environmental engineering. And it's been extremely rewarding and very exciting. Next slide. This, this would be my last one here. Just trying to show you, I love this image of the student looking through the funnel, right? trying to get, trying to look at the big picture. So historically, we've sort of taught civil engineering, for example, as you know, there's structures and there's transportation and there's construction and there's geotechnical, but they were often just isolated. You, know, you had a class on this, you had a class on that, you had a class on this. And we're trying to show how they are all interconnected. And more importantly, how engineers 
uh, the things that we design have significant impacts and how that we need to do a lot more than just understand the design of these things, but we need to know how they interact. So a lot of these things, you can see all these items, we're trying to stress more in our classes, many of those we talked about today. So it's been fun and uh, moving forward, we're hoping to take this beyond the classroom, uh, much as ASC and the League of Women Voters is doing here today because we believe in our infrastructure and we believe the more that people understand it, the better off we're all gonna be. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Penn. I went 30 seconds over, I apologize. <laughs> Typical engineering attention to precision. <laughs> I love engineers. I'm not an engineer myself, but there are a lot of them in my family, mostly civil engineers. And I love engineers particularly as a profession because they don't dwell much on complaining. They design and build out practical solutions to problems. And I just love that. In your last comments about, about the uh, collaboration for improving education, I like that too. I love professionals who seek to actively collaborate. So thank you, Michael Penn. Uh, for that and for your discussion of um, solid waste and Gretchen Bonhoff, your discussion of hazardous waste. Now we're going to go on to our panel. Starting off with Mimi Johnson. Mimi joined the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in May of 2020. She serve, serves as the director of the Office of Emerging Contaminants in the Environmental Management Division. She joined the DNR after several years at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Prior to returning home to Wisconsin and entering into state service, Mimi spent a decade in Washington, DC, working in consumer health and environmental policy. Mimi has a bachelor's degree from George Washington University and a master's from uh, Oslo Metropolitan University. You've got, you've got the, the local, the state, the national and the international perspective on these things, Mimi. So um, let's welcome Mimi, take it away. Great, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting me to join today's conversation. Um, I lead the department's Office of Emerging Contaminants, which is fairly young, only about 18 months old. And to date our primary contaminant of concern, it has been PFAS. As you'll hear in my remarks and likely during our discussion this afternoon, our agency recommendations very much align with the recommendations in this report card. This panel is also a, a panel of familiar faces, which is really a testament to the collective effort needed to address PFAS and emerging contaminants in Wisconsin. My fellow panelists' involvement has helped drive our work to innovate and educate uh, through participation in our working groups and advisory bodies. The infographic that you see on your screen was recently updated to correspond with the launch of a Safe Water for All initiative. Um, and I would encourage all of you to explore the DNR webpage for this initiative, which is meant to encourage ongoing dialogue about the importance of protecting our waters, um, not just from PFAS, but also from nitrates and lead. So just a real quick primer on PFAS. PFAS are a group of human-made chemicals that have been used for decades in a variety of products. They don't break down in the environment, and they've been discovered at concentrations of concern in groundwater, surface water, and drinking water. Some of the products that might contain PFAS and have been attributed to PFAS contamination include um, drinking water, stain-resistant carpeting and fabric like waterproof jackets or non-iron shirts, non-stick cookware, um, firefighting foam, specifically class B firefighting foam, as well as fast food packaging. Um, and we know that PFAS are discharged into the environment from industrial and commercial facilities, from military bases, airports, fire stations, or anywhere that might be using a triple F firefighting foam, and through waste products, including leachate from landfills and biosolids and effluent from wastewater treatment facilities. In Wisconsin, we have approximately 35 active sites with PFAS contamination. I'm gonna to jump to this green box of why should I care? And I'm not gonna go into great detail on the health impacts as that falls to our Department of Health Services and their role in our coordinated work on PFAS. But what we do know is that PFAS can persist in the environment and in the human body for long periods of time. 
Scientific peer-reviewed literature and resources from national and international bodies have found some of the harmful health effects on people um, who are exposed to different types of PFAS might include certain types of cancer, thyroid and heart issues, infertility and low birth weight, as well as developmental delays. And one thing that's not pictured in the screen box is that we've also um, seen recent studies on the impact on immune response as well, which is of great concern, especially during a, a global pandemic. So now I'm going to jump to the box about what we're doing about PFAS. Um, and as was just talked about a bit, that engagement and collaboration and, and stakeholder engagement is really critical to our work on emerging contaminants. Um, the, the unique thing about emerging contaminants such as PFAS is there is a, an absence of federal standards or regulation. And so this really necessitates the need um, or our collaborative work. Um, and so we work extensively with our Great Lakes counterparts, as well as regional and national organizations um, to share information and experiences. And within Wisconsin, we have a statewide interagency council charged with coordinating activities to address PFAS contamination. As Gretchen mentioned, the Wisconsin PFAS Action Council, or WISPAC, issued a PFAS action plan last December with a series of recommended actions and guiding principles. Um, among that includes site identification and investigations, and a key factor in addressing PFAS contamination is really knowing where it is in the state. So we work across our agency to gather samples from across the state. We, once we've gathered that data, we work in partnership with the Department of Health Services to assess the human health risk. At times, the sampling data may result in consumption advisories or health advisories. We've sampled more than 100 water bodies for PFAS in surface water and 55 water bodies for PFAS contamination in fish. We're also committed to ensuring that everyone has safe water to drink, and we've sampled um, more than 90 municipal water systems have been sampled in Wisconsin. Uh, only about five of those systems have exceeded recommended health levels. We also work in coordination with our colleagues at the Department of Health Services to develop protective standards, including for groundwater, drinking water, and surface water. And these standards aim to protect both Wisconsin residents and our natural resources. We also are uh, recognize the real impact PFAS contamination can have on communities. And so we work with residents, community leaders, responsible parties, and other stakeholders to provide technical assistance to best identify, contain, and prevent contamination. So just real quickly, some of the things that we could still be doing. Um, as I mentioned, many of our recommendations offered, many of the recommendations offered in the report, we, we very much concur with. And we had been very optimistic that the $23 million in PFAS related initiatives proposed in the budget this year um, would be passed. Um, we're also tracking comprehensive legislation such as the CLEAR Act in the Wisconsin Legislature and the PFAS Action Act in U.S. Congress, which could help advance many of the initiatives that you've identified in your report and that we've identified through WISPAC and other efforts. We need to quickly act on science-based protective and enforceable standards for drinking water, groundwater, and surface water, and ultimately other media as we learn more, maybe such as air. Um, we see a need to invest in ongoing and expanded source and site identification, and we must continue to support sampling efforts, including our public drinking water systems. We're one of only a few states in the region that have not yet sampled all of our public water systems, as well as our surface water and groundwater and continued sampling of fish and wildlife. We need to continue to engage in research around methodology, but also around how PFAS behaves within Wisconsin specific environments. And in terms of infrastructure and waste, we need to continue to invest in supporting our communities and giving them access to resources needed to find and address PFAS. Our work with PFAS and other emerging contaminants would never end if we're only chasing the contamination. So we need to continue to properly invest um, in our in, in resource um, so that we can utilize a multi-pronged approach again to really look to prevention, containment, and cleanup. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mimi. Next is Melissa Johnson. And uh, looking at, at Melissa's bio, I'm reminded of the old saying that if you want to get something done, give it to a woman who's already crazy busy. <laughs> so, Melissa Johnson is the Director of Solid Waste Management for Marathon County, directing business, gen business operations and solid waste programming and facilities serving central and north central Wisconsin. Serving as an adjunct faculty at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, 
Soils and Waste Resources Program, Melissa co-coordinated the curriculum for both the introductory and advanced waste management classes. Melissa is also in her sixth term as president of Associated Recyclers of Wisconsin. She's a treasurer for the Solid Waste Association of North America Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin County Solid Waste Management Association. Recently, she was appointed to the DNR's Waste and Materials Management Study Group, co-chairing that group, and she's a member of the DNR's PFOS Policy Advisory Group. In 2005, Governor Doyle appointed her to the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Waste Materials Recovery and Disposal. She is the 2002 recipient of the AROW Christy Dixon Recycler of the Year Award and was awarded a 2017 UW Green Bay Environment and Business Management Institute's Earth Caretaker Award. In her personal life, I can't imagine there is any, um, Melissa is an alder person for the city of Stevens Point and in, uh, is in her fifth term as president of Common Council. She's also in her third term as supervisor for the Portage County Board. She chairs the city's finance committee and the county's health care center committee, as well as the diversity affairs and inclusion committee. My goodness, Melissa, share with us some of your knowledge and expertise. Thanks, and I, I do love that saying because um, I know so many wonderful, and no offense to the gentleman on, on this, wonderful women who know how to do, run these amazing careers and do all these things and raise kids and get it all done, and my hat off to all of them. Um, so thanks everyone, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I am, passionately crazy about the work I do every day in my professional life. And here's the reason why. Um, this is illustrative of why the, the job that I do with all of my colleagues, with people like Brad um, uh, Wolbert, who's on the line, and Lynn, this is a noble profession. And just a real quick story, I was in an airport in Atlanta waiting for a connecting flight. And this was obviously pre-COVID. Now I don't go anywhere. But um, these women were behind me. We were all waiting to get connected on a different flight. And they were from Beirut, Lebanon. And if you haven't seen um, images of the garbage crisis in Beirut, Lebanon, please Google it. You will see garbage bags piled as high as street lights and traffic lights because they couldn't figure out where to put the damn landfill, right? Nobody wanted it in their backyard. And we chatted and they said they were here in the States looking to expand their business, visit family. What do you do, Melissa? I said, well, I'm a solid waste professional. I build and operate uh, solid waste systems. And the one woman grabbed my arm and she just would not let go. And she goes, you must come to Beirut. You have to help us fix our garbage problem. And I said, but surely, you know, you've got Hezbollah kind of, as a terrorist group, you've got the Israeli Defense Forces encroaching on your territory. You've got the Syrians and ISIS and garbage has to be the last of your concerns. And she said, you don't understand. That's politics. If you don't manage the garbage every day, you will impact people's lives every single day. So it was at that moment, it was just like, I mean, I'm always proud of what we do, but that just illustrates the critical importance of everything that we do every single day. All of my colleagues across the state, across this great nation, to make sure your life is protected, that you do not have garbage bags piled as high as street lights and traffic lights. And it's just such a thrill to be an advocate for this industry and to do this work. So that's why I'm so happy to be here today. So a couple of things. Um, I am the director of the Marathon County Solid Waste Department. We have, we're not, we are, we may be owned by Marathon County. We are an enterprise fund. We use zero tax dollars. We operate as a business within county government. We have an 18 county service area. So I have customers in 18 counties in central, west central, northern and east central Wisconsin. Our county landfills are not run as county landfills anymore. That's, that's a dinosaur. 
Um, almost all municipally owned landfills in the state of Wisconsin are indeed enterprise funds. They don't use tax dollars. We charge fees for the services that we render. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. It was kind of not as clear in, in, but you're right, Mike, we do have to look, watch the expenses and the revenues and they better, they better match or at least make a profit because we use our profits to invest back into the community. We support the medication drop box program and a without charge hazardous waste program for households. And that's what we do in the municipal world is we invest back into our communities. I work with my colleagues across the state to advocate for affirmative and progressive and positive solid waste policies. Um, one of those policies is helping people understand, and this was discussed in the sidebar and you alluded to it, Mike, and actually Gretchen did as well, and talking, talking about the landfill tipping fees and the money going to the state. Wisconsin landfills collect 75 to $100 million a year in what's called a landfill tipping fee. And that's broken out into uh, the recycling fee and the environmental repair fee and uh, well compensation fund and waste facility siting board. But the bulk of it goes for environmental programs like non-point source pollution, our recycling programs, um, conservation grants to counties. So the $13 a ton, there's a lot of money, but unfortunately my colleagues and I have been advocating four years. Let's use the recycling fee money, which is about 30 to $36 million a year. Let's give it to local units of government to actually back, invest back into their recycling programs. Only $19 million of that money is collect, that is collected is sent to um, Wisconsin municipalities. That's a legislature decision, which we fight every single budget cycle. Um, and Marathon County has the newest licensed landfill in the state of Wisconsin, which opened in 2014. So Mike, when you mentioned that there were no new landfills, my property does have three landfills, but we have a brand new, brand new license. It is not connected. It is not an expansion. It is a separate landfill. Um, it may not show up necessarily that way. Um, so, um, Anyway, I'm proud of the work we do. I am affiliated with all of these groups. I work on a wide variety of, of solid waste, um, special waste, which I would call PFAS special waste. It has not been categorized under CERCLA as a hazardous waste, so let's not take that leap quite yet. Um, and um, again, I'm just happy to be here. I, I love talking about this industry. When I started in this industry, I was appalled that nobody was standing on the highest mountaintop and saying, we are the coolest kids on the block doing the most important work for this state. And I have spent the last 20 years trying to do that at anywhere I can and with anyone who will listen to me and ask my family, even when I'm on vacation, I will be looking at dumpsters and talking to hotel owners to see if they actually have an adequate recycling program. So. Again, thanks for the opportunity and I look forward to the discussion. Way to go, Melissa. <laughs> Next, we're gonna hear from Lynn Morgan. She is a representative of private enterprise in this domain. Hooray for that. Um, the name of her company is, is a hint. Lynn Morgan is the Manager of Public Affairs for Waste Management. She's an enthusiastic recycling advocate who's been deeply involved in every aspect of Wisconsin's recycling program since the passage of the state's landmark 1989 recycling law. Lynn has influenced recycling and waste policy through her participation in state, regional, and national dialogues. She serves on Wisconsin's PFOS External Advisory Group Waste and Materials Management Study Group and Brownfields Study Group, all state appointed bodies advising the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. So Lynn, please share your perspective with us. 
Thank you, Dorothy. And uh, thank you, everybody who's listening in today. I love that this infrastructure study was conducted. I think it's a phenomenal snapshot and a great opportunity to talk about um, you know, what this really means. Uh, Melissa alluded to you know, some folks that felt that their solid waste infrastructure was at that moment in time as important as uh, what was happening politically and in a war zone. And I think what that speaks to is that every environmental misstep we make has a consequence for somebody somewhere. You can't make an environmental misstep without having that reverberate somewhere. It may not be close to you. It may be further away. It may be halfway around the world, but there's a consequence. And so I think when we think about our infrastructure, um, we may feel good about or you know relatively good about where we are locally but let's expand our lens and think about what the consequences are so recycling would be a great example um, we recycle and there are a lot of wonderful benefits of that i won't touch on all of them i suspect people are aware of many of them but let's just cite as one that you can serve landfill space so that the local landfill perhaps uh isn't um, doesn't need to expand as quickly um, now, maybe that landfill is near you, so it's a direct connection for you, but chances are it's further away, maybe a couple counties away, it may be even a little further than that. But another benefit would be that recycling saves natural resources. Now, the natural resources that are saved may be in another part of the United States. They may be somewhere else in the world, so you may not experience that benefit. Recycling saves energy because it takes less energy to recover the um, uh, value of recyclables as a raw material generally than it does to harvest new raw materials as inputs into manufacturing. The impact of producing that energy demand may or may not be one that you feel right at your doorstep, but there's a consequence. So when I think about that, um, what it makes me think about is something that Mike alluded to, which is you know, it's not just whether the infrastructure is there, it's also whether we collectively are using it wisely. And in that regard, I'm not going to throw a grade out there, but I think that maybe I'm going to give us an incomplete in our efforts to use our resources wisely. And one specific area that I'll, I'll mention as an example of that is food waste. There is an incredible amount of unwanted food that could have been consumed that is um, harvested, you know, cultivated or harvested somewhere, transported to a local outlet, uh, purchased by a consumer, perhaps brought home to their environment or their institution, and then discarded on, you know, it spoils or it winds up being unwanted, who knows what, why it, it, it winds up being excess, but the solid waste composition study that Brad Wolbert and Mimi and the good folks at DNR just completed found that unwanted food, discarded food that could have been consumed is actually one of the largest categories of waste that we throw away as a state. They found that it, at least in that snapshot, that it was somewhere around 14 and a half percent of what's discarded in the state. Now, to tie that back together, that food waste has an incredible impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Think about what was entailed in, in harvesting that food, creating it, transporting it, and so forth. It's an incredible, incredible waste of that resource, but just as importantly, it is exacting a huge toll on our environment in the form of greenhouse gas emissions that could have been avoided. And you can also add in the social impact of people who are food insecure um, not having access to that food as well. So I bring this forward as an example of not using our infrastructure wisely. One thing we haven't done at, at, in our state is really undertaken an effort to focus on waste reduction. So this gets to how we use our resources and our infrastructure. If we could focus on waste reduction and persuade people to discard less food, waste less food, we would be having an impact not just locally in what happens at our local landfill, but also around the world in, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it has been estimated that nationally, the impact of discarded food 
is in terms of greenhouse gas emissions actually exceeds the impact of the airline industry. So think about all the focus we, we hear about uh, in terms of who's flying where and you know whether they're purchasing carbon offsets somewhere to, to ac account for that. And then just compare that to you know, what might be happening in your own refrigerator or on your own kitchen counter. Um, uh, what's not gonna make it to the table? And what can we do to avoid wasting that food? What can we coach the public to do? So I would like us to think about expanding our lens of what good infrastructure looks like to include not just our local impacts, but global impacts, particularly around global warming, and to expand our definition of infrastructure to include what the public knows and understands and how vested the public is in joining us in, in trying to do better. So thank you. I really, I really enjoyed listening to everything so far and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Lynn. And I I must say the speakers so far to me um, epitomize the fact that we have people in positions of responsibility that are both compassionate and competent. And, and you know, we're, we're zigzagging back between somebody who's in private enterprise and somebody's at state level government, local government and so forth. This, this is an area that's perfect for if not apolitical, then at least nonpartisan collaboration. It's 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 a way out of this polarized mess that we're in, and that's one of the things that made it so appealing to the League of, of Women Voters. Aside from just the innate total importance of infrastructure to our 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 ability to survive and thrive in this state. So we're gonna go back to the DNR now with Brad Wolbert. Uh, Brad is uh, with the Waste and Materials Management Bureau. He's the director of that bureau for the DNR. He's a 30 year veteran of the DNR and has directed the department's Waste and Materials Management Program since March of 2020. He, he, uh, his previous positions at the DNR included the Sol Solid Waste and Recycling Section Chief and hydrogeologist in the solid waste and the leaking underground storage tank programs. He holds a master's degree from, the, from UW-Madison in geography and water resources management. And with that, um, bring us home, Brad. Uh, well, thank you. I wanna thank the, uh, the league and also the uh, ASCE for putting this on and for inviting me to be part of it. And hopefully we can answer some, some questions from folks. Um, I just thought I'd start out by uh, just saying a little bit about the DNR's role in waste and materials management. And this neglects, uh, I don't have a role, uh, my bureau doesn't really have a, a lead role in the cleanup programs, uh, which uh, was referred to earlier uh, as hazardous waste. What we call the hazardous waste program is a little, a little different here at the DNR. Um, but our, our role, uh, first of all, overriding everything is to protect uh, public health and the environment. Um, we do that in the, the waste area by uh, establishing standards. Uh, so just like, um, you know, you've got a uh, plumbing code or a, uh, standards for bridges, uh, we have uh, standards that are in code for, for uh, waste facilities. Um, we also provide technical assistance to folks who are trying to build or operate these facilities. Um, and we, uh, we inspect and uh, enforce uh, compliance so that we hopefully don't have to do a whole lot of hard-nosed enforcing, but we do have to do that sometimes. We do have the authority to do that. Um, what we cover is, is a lot. Uh, uh, Mike mentioned the municipal solid waste landfills. Um, those have federal standards that we, uh, we implement uh, at the state level. Um, what we call hazardous waste uh, is the um, uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, uh, subtitle C, talks about hazardous waste, which is a specific set of uh, waste types. Uh, it, there's actually long lists in the, in the regulations about what is included in that and also some, um, some uh, definitions of other waste that may not be on the list, but if they're toxic enough or if they're um, you know, uh, uh, explosive, let's say, or something like that, uh, they would also be 
considered hazardous waste. So we, that's a cradle to grave program that we uh, make sure is working here in the state. Again, a federal program we, we run on behalf of the uh, EPA. Um, and uh, then there's a whole variety of other wastes that are neither municipal solid wastes or listed or, or um, uh, characteristic hazardous wastes. Uh, construction waste, think of uh, you know, demolition of a building or a, a home renovation, uh, medical waste that are generated in hospitals or clinics, uh, or even at home sometimes, um, sediments that are from dredge projects, um, and then the activities that, that are uh, part of managing those wastes that we uh, regulate as well includes processing, transportation of the waste, uh, incineration, or combustion of those wastes, uh, composting things like that. So a lot of different processes. Um, as far as recycling goes, uh, we've heard a lot about that and I'm sure we'll have some other questions today, but uh, uh, that's mostly a local government program as Melissa pointed out, uh, that is uh, funded uh, in part uh, through state funds that are generated at landfills, uh, but the local governments have to come up with the balance of those, of those funds. And, and we do have some standards in the state for recycling or some items that are banned from landfills in the state. Uh, we uh, have a, a specific program for electronic waste called eCycle Wisconsin. That's been around for a little over 10 years and it's been uh, very successful and I think uh, in many respects a national model and that takes a little bit of different approach. Uh, that enlists the manufacturers and uh, uh, to some extent the retailers and the, the processors in a, in a shared responsibility model where um, funding for recycling those materials is, comes in large part from the manufacturers who sell and make money on those, on those uh, devices. Uh, and that's, that shared responsibility model is starting to be applied to other types of materials like packaging uh, in states like Maine and Oregon. Uh, in addition, a couple of other things that we do in, in my bureau, uh, there's a lot of uh, what we call high volume industrial byproducts, which are things like coal ash and paper mill sludge and foundry sand and that kind of thing. And some of that material, it's, it's, that material tends to be very sort of uniform and predictable in its qualities. And because of that, we can specify some uses that it's suited for that keep it out of landfills and puts it to productive use. So we administer a program for that again, you know, under a set of regulations. Uh, and then generally monitoring industry developments. And uh, I put down conduct relevant studies on this slide and uh, Melissa or Lynn, I think referred to th this too. We just finished a uh, waste composition study. That was actually one of the recommendations in the ASCE report on things that we, we could do to raise the grade. And we just finished uh, our 2020, 2021 waste composition study. And as Lynn pointed out, the single largest category of waste, and we, we had like 85 different categories, but the single largest one was, was food waste. And that doesn't even include food scraps. So peels and pits and things like that. That is just, that's food that was probably edible or close to it when it went into the landfill. So that is a, that's a focus uh, that, you know, the re one of the reasons you do that study, I think Mike mentioned this, is that you want to know, you know, what, what the target is, what you're trying to work on. And that made it pretty loud and clear to us that food waste is uh, a, uh, something we need to work on for all the reasons that, that Lynn talked about. So that's kind of what we're about uh, in my program at the DNR. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you again for the, my chance to talk. All right. Thank you very much, Brad. And I really like your term, shared responsibility model. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that goes all the way down. Uh, probably most importantly to the waste generators. That's you, me, and our, all our neighbors. <laughs> so um, the, as the League of Women Voters was winding up this series of informational programs, we, we've already begun thinking, well, now what do you do? What, what do we do with this stuff? How do you turn all this excellent information into action? And I think it, it is very apropos that we are ending a series of programs with a discussion of hazardous 
and solid waste because I can't think of any other category of infrastructure that is so universally important to every community and every family in our state. And uh, certainly this subject should raise people's curiosity and their desire to find out from local fish officials and so forth, the folks that are running this infrastructure, just what's being done locally? How, how up to snuff are we? And, and how can we citizens help things along the way? So thank you to our panel members. I just wanted to mention that uh, Jean Kundi, who was uh, another representative from the uh, private sector, uh, Johnson Controls was unfortunately unable to join us today and uh, we're sorry for that, but uh, the panel members that we, we did hear from had our, our gems. So we're gonna move on um, now to the question and answer session. And Laura Gintz, the legislative coordinator and administrative assistant at the State League of Women Voters has been monitoring the chat. And I can see that we, we have a lot of participants today and we have a lot of questions. So uh, Laura, you're gonna, you're gonna be challenged more than usual at sifting through and, and uh, winnowing and bringing up the questions. So, but uh, again, thank you. Um, thank you, Laura, for what you're about to do. And thanks to um, everyone who has done the presentations today and thanks to you in the audience who showed up and we'll try to get, get your questions answered. All right, thank you, Dorothy, so much. And thank you panelists and presenters for such um, an enlightening presentation so far. Uh, our first question is from Lisa Conley. She was asking, is Wisconsin still accepting solid waste from other states? And what about hazardous waste? And I believe um, maybe Bradley Wol Wolpert could start with this um, answer. Sure. Um, yep. Uh, so I think I answered it in the chat too, but uh, but the the general answer part of it was in the report, and that is that we have uh, really reduced the amount of uh, solid waste that comes in from out of state. Uh, part of that was that we raised the state tipping fee, which made it economically less. And that was the legislature. When I say we, I, sh I should say Wisconsin as a whole, not, not the DNR. Um, mm -hmm. But they raised the, um, the tipping fees for, um, for waste in general, which meant that out-of-state waste, uh, it was less competitive for them to, to bring it into Wisconsin compared to other states. Um, so that's the solid waste side. The hazardous waste side, we, you know, we have facilities that treat hazardous waste uh, we don't have any disposal facilities for hazardous waste. In fact, we've been criticized kind of from the other direction on that. So, um, and I've just been asked to start my video. Let's see if I can do that. That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, so, so that's kind of where we are on, on that. All right, thank you so much. It looked like Melissa Johnson had a couple of comments on this as well in the chat. Sure, thank you. And again, my video was stopped, so I'll, I'll just go like this. Anyway, um, yeah, there is, I put a link in the in the chat box and you feel free to share that out with other people. It's on the DNR's website. It's a capacity re report and it shows all the landfills and all the different categories. Um, and it shows, you know, the amount of, of waste coming in from other states. In other states would be Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, and Michigan. It's really not a lot. I think it was in 2020. I think it might have been maybe 400,000 ton. It or yeah, around there of the overall what five and a half million ton. But I can tell you, as a landfill owner, um, and I'm running a business, I, I'm assuming a household garbage in Michigan is not a whole lot different than household garbage in Wisconsin. I think. Um, and if someone wanted to bring garbage from a jurisdiction in Michigan, I, I would probably go, yeah, let's talk business. So thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Vernetta. She asks, 
how much methane is either burned off or not captured from landfills. Uh, let me jump in there and uh, Lynn or Melissa may have something to add, but um, we have regulations uh, for modern landfills that require uh, at some point as they start to fill up uh, that, that, that methane be captured and at least flared uh, or burned off in some way so that we, re we uh, change the methane, convert it to carbon dioxide, which is much less of a, it's still a greenhouse gas, but it's much less a potent greenhouse gas. Um, a lot of our landfills in the state uh, have over the years tried or been successful in using the landfill gas for energy in some way. So whether for direct heating or for uh, liquid natural gas fuel um, uh, or for just energy uh, electricity production. So that's been uh, that's a very established technology uh, in the landfill business. Yeah, and at the Marathon County Solid Waste Department, we do follow um, all the, the federal guidelines. Our air permit was actually just uh, posted for public comment because we're renewing. And so we have to meet the standards of the Clean Air Act. And um, our, our capture efficiency ranges depending upon how much open area we have when we put wells in but we do capture the gas and it is used to produce electricity, at least at this time. Lynn can probably talk more specifically to some of the endeavors that waste management has taken, which is a little more um, broad than what Marathon County has done. Yeah, so um, I love this topic because uh, Wisconsin was one of the first in the nation to proceed with using landfill gas to generate electricity. So it all started uh, back in 1985 at a uh, landfill called Metro Landfill on the south side of Milwaukee. And now, as Melissa and Brad alluded to, uh, virtually every major landfill in the state has some form of landfill gas reuse because there's a very high energy value there. So flaring off is very acceptable. It, it uh, is a good destroyer of contaminants, but, you know, it's not um, it's not the best utilization because there is good energy value in that gas that um, can be put out on the grid and offset other types of energy production. All right, thank you so much for those enlightening comments. Um, we also have another question from Michael Goodman. He is asking, why is paper volume decreasing? Is it due to the increased use of digital media or from something else? Uh, so most, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, Lynn, you, go ahead. I think that was you. Um, so I grew up in a household that got three newspapers, three print newspapers, boom, 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 4 a.m., 5 a.m. every morning. And, and a dad who got up early and drank a whole pot of coffee reading all three papers. Um, I inherited that. Well, my house doesn't get a print newspaper anymore. It's digital, um, it, as the as, uh, questioner mentioned. Uh, and so some categories of paper the use of paper has declined dramatically. And then other categories of fiber, which paper is a part of, like cardboard, um, it's gone up. And at the same time, you know, when we look at recycling facilities, the input of plastics, for example, has increased. So uh, 15 years ago or so, Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong on that date, but 15 years ago or so, you probably would have constructed a new recycling facility assuming about 80% fiber and about 20% containers. These days you would build assuming about 65% fiber and about 35% containers. So the, you know, that's part of the infrastructure question here um, is that the waste stream isn't static. It, ch it changes as consumer trends change. And so we're having to continually adapt and make sure that that infrastructure is um, correctly designed and sized to handle what people are buying and discarding in you know, these days at this point in time. And, and I'll bet, Lynn, that when your dad picked up those papers, when he held them, it was like this. They were this wide. That's right. Now, mm -hmm. if I pick up a paper, it's like this. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, so they're even, they become more condensed, the sizes. If you were to come to my office, well, my office, not this office, this is my home. Um, I have no file cabinets. I, I do not like paper. Digital is pretty much the way I store almost everything, even engineering documents. 
So that's that transition. And, you know, for paper mills, I understand their plight, but that's, that's what's happened. Same goes for doctor's offices. Medical um, record. Yes, it is very interesting how um, with consumer trends that um, the waste has changed quite a bit, uh, the cardboard increasing through the Amazon effect and getting rid of the paper since we've been going to digital forms. Um, so another question that we have is what happens to landfills over time? I'm sorry, what, what happens to landfills over time? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll take a stab and then pass it on. Um, <laughs> uh, I've only been around a certain number of years, uh, but the, the, you know, we're in a generation of landfills that are highly designed and engineers as, and engineered, as, as Mike said. Um, so we don't know what happens over hundreds or thousands of years uh, yet, but, um, uh, but they, landfills fill up in, in Wisconsin and most other places. Uh, they're often expanded on uh, because it's the infrastructure is there and the routes are, are there and everything uh, to use those facilities. Uh, at some point they would close and uh, uh, they would be capped uh, with uh, materials similar to what was used in the liner to prevent water from getting into the landfills and creating additional leachate um, that has to be managed uh, and to contain the gas so that it doesn't escape willy nilly into the atmosphere. And, you, and then green space, and I've noticed a, a trend lately, um, including in Wisconsin, to use that green space in part at least for energy production by putting solar panels on. So we'll see if that uh, takes off even further, but it's an, to me, that's an encouraging use of that, of that land. And I think to the question, what happens to them? I mean, what happens at first is a, there's massive decomposition, right? Because you've got really rich organic waste mass. It's wet because, you know, if our household garbage is pretty gooey and, and it decomposes really quickly. And then it just kind of slows down. Like it gets old, like all of us, we slow down a little bit. And, and the processes within really slow down. We drilled a gas well new gas well, a replacement gas well on our oldest landfill. We have three on the property. And, you know, we're drilling down. It's just like drilling a, a water well, drilling, drilling, drilling. And the, and the um, drillers turned around and turned to me and go, we're pulling up nothing but soil. Did you guys put soil in this landfill? And no, where we're drilling, this waste was put in there probably 1980 through 1985, 89. What had happened was all of that organic fraction had decomposed into a type of compost and was now actually starting to produce nitrogen gas rather than any methane and oxygen. It was in its final stages of decomposition. So, I mean, we close up these landfills. It's that closed uh, dry tomb sort of concept. Um, and then kind of monitor them over time. Marathon County has um, almost $20 million in cash and bonds um, and investments for our long-term care of our landfills. Well, about two thirds is for long-term care. Another third is for closure of our area B and Bluebird Ridge landfills. So we have all this cash set aside and every year we use that cash to do all the long-term care maintenance. And we have to do that for 40 years after we close the landfill. So is it a perfect system? No, but it's the system we have right now. You have to put up money for 40 years. What's that? You have to put up money for 40 years. You have to put up you, money. We have we you, have you, the money, Brad. I in, promise in you. Years, you know, in year 60 and year 80, yes, year 60, County, we'll yes. still be taking care of that land. Or yeah. what's left of it. Or I think there was actually someone else that asked about, are we digging up these old landfills? And it's a good question because it is something we are exploring in Marathon County, that old landfill that we got the soil out of uh, that was compost. We're looking at that footprint as the possible next landfill and mining that out, grabbing the ferrous material and the non-ferrous and sending off to markets, maybe grabbing that soil like I'm, I'm letting you know my plans. I'm going to submit a plan to you, Brad, and you're going to have to go. This is wonderful. Um, can't wait. Could, can't wait. Yeah, 
you know me, I like to innovate. Um, but could we do that? And, and so it's been done elsewhere. I don't think it's been done. Yeah, Shawano County did it. But um, so there are options on those old landfills. And Lynn, if, I don't know if you have anything else to add to my blah, blah. So no, I, I think you, between you and Brad, I think you've really painted a, a vivid picture of the life cycle of a landfill. Yes, thank you so much for that wonderful um, description of what happens to the landfill over time. Our next question is from Patty. She asks, does combining all recycling materials in one collection container lead to less recycling because of contamination? I'm thinking especially of paper and cardboard getting wet in the recycling container. Who is that guy on Welcome Back, Cotter? Ooh, ooh, ooh. I got a, <laughs> I got a Gabe. I got a Gabe that one. Um, so uh, it's a great question. So here's, here's the deal. Is there a higher rate of contamination percentage-wise? There, there usually is if you look at most recycling programs than programs that have the residents separate the materials and collect them separately, uh, maintain that separation all the way through. But the trade-off is that the switch to single stream uh, dramatically increases the volume of material that is diverted because people who are already inclined to recycle, recycle more. It's a little more convenient for people. Um, people who thought recycling was a hassle when they had to separate into different bins or buckets, they get on the program now that you make it so easy that you just put it all together in one in one container. So um, people, I've heard a really wide range of estimates through the years, but I think the rule of thumb is that you at a minimum see a 20% increase when you switch to those all-in-one type recycling program. So even though the contamination rate winds up being a little higher, overall you wind up recycling a lot more because you're getting more material in the first place. Lynn, Lynn runs one of the largest MRFs in the state of Wisconsin. She's, she's the expert. All right, thank you, Lynn, for your expertise on the matter then. Uh, we have a question asking about the um, soil or the compost, compost that was found in the landfills that we were talking about, Melissa, and they asked, would it contain heavy metals or other pollutants or contaminants? It, it actually, it will look and smell like compost, but it will have to go to another subtitle D landfill. Um, so one of the strategies would be to use it as alternative daily cover. Um, or to, you know, in other ways to use it in a subtitle D landfill. Absolutely. And when I say subtitle D, so the Resource Conservation Recovery Act pairs um, landfills into a couple different sections. Um, subtitle D landfills are municipal solid waste landfills. That's what I operate, that's what waste management operates in Wisconsin. Subtitle C are those so, um, hazardous waste landfills. And of course there are none in Wisconsin. So yeah, but absolutely there would be metals and, you know, other sort of things that you wouldn't want to, you know, necessarily play with it. All right. We have another question. Um, this one is regarding PFAS. Um, <clears throat> apparently PFAS are located in everything from the vaccine to household chemicals. Why are they all being umbrellaed under the same um, type of grouping? And is, it, is that a big challenge to um, regulating them since there are so many different types of compounds? Is Mimi still on? I am here, yep. Yeah. Um, so PFAS is a family of compounds. Uh, within the last couple of years, we've really jumped from saying it was a couple thousand to now upwards of 10,000 different types of PFAS. And they're characterized by a carbon chain plus an attached plus attached fluorines plus a functional group on the end. And PFOA and PFOS are the older compounds. And so we've been able to study them the longest. Um, there's more conclusive findings about how they behave and, and where they might be found. Um, and those are the longer chains. Then there's the kind of newer, shorter chains that have come onto the market to um, replace those as they were discontinued um, over the last several years. Um, but 
So the, the longer chains, PFO and PFOS, they're still produced elsewhere in the world. Um, they might be imported um, either as a final product or as materials used in production. The shorter chains um, that were originally and continue to be marketed as safer alternatives include Gen X, which is what's used to make some of the um, non-stick coating, um, and that sort of replaces PFOA. And then there's PFBS, which has been used as a replacement for PFOS. We typically, a lot of our, our health-related advisories and research is really based off of the PFOS. That's what our consumption advisories are issued based off of. And that's really where um, Department of Health Services and the, the federal counterpart at the CDC also um, have focused primarily on PFOS. Now, the question about regulating as a class or standalone, I think that that really is rooted in that, that issue of you know, 10,000 plus compounds and infinite uses, we don't really know how all PFAS behave. Um, and, you know, I think we have, there are varying degrees of assertion about how essential and safe the different types of PFAS are. Um, so I think, you know, there's still definitely a question. Um, and we, we heard throughout our PFAS action plan development, both concerns about, you um, regulating as a class, but also a strong desire to do so. Um, and I think we just don't quite have enough information yet um, to, to be able to do so. And one of the items in the CLEAR Act, um, again, that's the legislation at the state, um, that would require the DNR and DHS to work together to study and issue a report on the feasibility of regulating as a class. Um, there's a similar expectation that would be placed upon the EPA at the federal level. So I think in the interim, we'll be seeing a lot more research being done just in terms of um, the method and theories behind different PFAS, how they might appear or behave in certain ways, where they might be originating from. You know, some, some more recent work has seen um, these shorter chains over time behaving more like the longer chains that, that we used to have. Um, and, you know, we still see quite a bit of PFOA and PFOS showing up um, again, really probably rooted in the importing. So um, I guess, you know, back to the, the original question, there are a lot of compounds. They all are, you know, related in some way in their basic chemistry, but they all behave very differently. And so there's a lot of challenge behind um, how we might do this. And I think as Melissa posted in the chat, you know, we are as a society, very accustomed to the, the benefits of PFAS. I mean, it's a, a very smart uh, chemical and that it, you know, it repels water, it repels stains, it's, it makes life easier. Um, and so I think it, it is, um, it's everywhere and we're, we're just now sort of learning and asking questions to understand exactly how, how pervasive and, and prevalent it is. All right, thank you so much, Mimi, for giving us a quite a rundown on PFAS and the different types of chemicals and some of the challenges that that um, causes. Um, and with that, um, I would like to pass it back over to Dorothy. That was our final question. Thank you very much, panelists and pre pre presenters. And didn't we have a lot of great questions and the answers from our presenters and panel members were just right on the mark, uh, clear and concise. Thank you very much. To uh, wrap things up, I'll just remind everybody that links to recordings for the category meetings, all of the category meetings are available on the League of, of Women Voters of Wisconsin website. And uh, you can, Go look at them now. You can share them with folks, and in the uh, in the future, in your local leagues and your local communities, when an infrastructure issue comes to mind, you can refer back to these, and they will serve as a stepping off place, an informed stepping off place for action in our individual communities. It's been my pleasure to. Uh, work with everybody on this program. And I, I thank all the participants, uh, the presenters and the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin staff and all of the uh, ASCE uh, Wisconsin engineers, folks who uh, collaborated, collaborated on this. It's, it's been really great. And to those of you in the audience, 
Thank you for your thoughtful and respectful questions and for your attendance. To uh, wrap things up, say hello. We have Louise Petering who will continue to close out the meeting. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Before moving to a call to action on infrastructure, I wanna thank several uh, folks for the uh, contributions they've made to this program. Thanks first to Carl Sutter for arranging for category meetings and uh, for the authors for these meetings and for his comments today about the ASCE Wisconsin. Uh, thanks go to Kenneth Michael and Jennifer Schock who served as volunteer co-chairs for the ASCE Wisconsin 2020 report card. And thanks also to Martin Hansen and Jake Brunaler who participated in the steering committee and finally, I would like to send special thanks to Carol Diggleman. She's both a league member and an ASCE member for organizing all seven infrastructure category meetings. Double thanks to you, Carol. Finally, uh, congratulations to the ASCE Wisconsin section on your recent award as the National ASCE 2021 Advocate of the Year. The League has valued this partnership and this collaboration with you in the public interest. Next slide. Many thanks to the League of Women Voters planning team you see members you see listed here, both staff and volunteer League members from around Wisconsin for all their contributions to this educational program about Wisconsin hazardous waste and solid waste infrastructure. Your early and continued behind the scenes planning has been invaluable. Next slide. The League of Wisconsin, League of Women Voters of Wisconsin now urges your infrastructure call to action. Act now, a call made more compelling by recent progress in Washington DC for significant federal infrastructure spending. Last week, the Senate passed a bipartisan $1 trillion infrastructure bill, and the debate on it continues in Washington. Infrastructure needs your support now. League members and participants, your support for action on infrastructure investment will help move this along. Infrastructure and investment now will reduce and eliminate the price we are currently paying for our crumbling infrastructure. As ASCE states in its failure to act report, every US household will pay $3,300 on average every single year for the next 20 years if we continue our current pattern of infrastructure spending. That is $3,300 a year of lost money for each household with absolutely no return. Decision makers who hold the purse strings need to hear from us today and regularly to understand we want to experience the savings from improved resilient infrastructure. So identify and jot down your local infrastructure concerns and priorities Begin conversations, tweets, Zooms, however you communicate with friends, neighbors, and local officials. Tell them your concerns more than once. Talk to federal, state, county, town, and municipal elected officials. Go to the League of Women Voters home site, a web, website homepage and find the study on Wisconsin infrastructure. It's at the bottom left column of the, the bottom of the left column of our homepage. You may read the failure to act report. Contact the League of Women Voters at lwbwi.org about your infrastructure concerns. Our infrastructure must serve all of us, support infrastructure investment. Many thanks for joining us this afternoon and joining us possibly for past category meetings. Have a very good evening and stay in touch with the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. Next slide.